we carry on with our explanation for chapter two, and we are explaining section one, which we, which we're talking about railway rolling stock subsystems. We have talked about the subsystems like the bogey, the wheel set, and we will carry on uh, with some of the other subsystems. So we, in the previous section, we talked about the bogey, and now we'll be talking about the wheel sets. The wheel sets ha can have different types, and the monoblock is the famous type where the whole uh, 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 wheel is casted as a one block. Sometimes some systems would use a tire block, and this is for light rail or guided buses. The function of the wheel sets is to uh, do torque transmission. Sometimes you'd have a hollow axles to allow ultrasonics and to reduce the weight. This is some of the things that we can mention about wheel sets. The suspension system, we can talk about a primary suspension system and the secondary suspension system. It's, it's located between the axle and the bogey. It the primary uh, suspension system reduce, removes high frequency vibrations. How does it that? It, it, through a group of uh, uh, springs and dampers, and, what, uh, and th there are different types. So I just want to explain the concept of unsprung mass. So it reduced the unsprung mass. And by the unsprung mass is that mass that is not related, if we can have a look at this bogey, it's the mass from almost the half of the wheel downwards that does not have any suspension element associated with it. So this is unsprung mass, does not, the frequency of that mass is not, uh, is not removed from the, uh, through the suspension system. So there are different types. The leaf spring is very old and it's a friction kind of, uh, 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 a friction kind of uh, damping system. Rubber elements are being used. They are lightweight, come back. They, they are shear force predominant, but they have poor lateral stability. Coil springs and dampers, this is the famous, uh, this is what is common. You have coil springs and dampers, like the example here. This is coil, uh, uh, that, uh, sorry, this is a spring. And that's a damper or coil springs. So this is a coil spring and this is a damper. So this is what, uh, co what consists of, of the, what the suspension system consists of. This is the primary one. And they are lightweight, compact. Uh, they have, uh, springs has low damping, but the dampers do the viscous, uh, the dampers, they do all the damping effect through transferring kinetic energy into uh, into in, uh, into uh, thermal energy. So this is how they dissipate energy. And there is friction damping, which we mentioned earlier. The secondary suspension systems removes low frequency vibrations. Yo dampers reduce body shell and bogey rotation and raise critical speed. Air suspension systems are the most popular. And to get air suspension, this is what is an what an air sus how an air suspension look like. So this is uh, the. the so th this is how an air suspension looks like. So this is uh, this is for primary su uh, suspension system, secondary suspension system. So now what you really need to remember that there is a primary suspension system in the vehicle, there is a secondary suspension system. One's remove high frequency, which is the primary one's remo removes low frequency. The primary suspension system consists of uh, coil springs and dampers. The secondary suspension system might have this air suspension, uh, air suspension, and also uses some kind of act. Sometimes, uh, recently, they they introduced the active suspension system where there is a control mechanism that control how much damping is being, uh, how much damping is being done through uh, through a, a group of uh, a control mechanism that control uh, a group of sensors that control and measure the vibrations, and based on that, uh, arrange the response. Now, the section 1.8 will be talking about rail vehicle body shells, and this is the body of the vehicle. So it has a group of functions, support passengers or freight loads, transmit traction and braking forces, protect occupants in case of train wreck, protect occupants in we from weather, facilitate loading and unloading, carry any other systems, issues, it could be an integral body shell or a tabular design consists of a global components. Increasing design complexity, this can be an issue. Lightweight operations, it is encouraged that you have a lightweight body, but a robust body. 
So what are the materials that you use? Steel and aluminium are the most common ones. Aluminium is being used more. Carbon steel versus stainless steel because aluminium is lighter. And aluminium for light rail. Composites, sometimes it's a mix of both. Now for the rail vehicle air system, there are a group of uh, air systems that, uh, that uses compressed air. Those are brakes, air suspension doors, bantograph, and you, you hear this sound when, an air, when uh, an air system is being used. So they are compressed electronically and uh, compressors electronically driven, uh, driven or mechanically drive off prime uh, movers. So it can be electronically or mechanically. They consist of, uh, there are different types, piston, axial, radial, and screw compressors. The compressed air is stored in, main reservoir, uh, in the main reservoir. For the rail vehicle electric systems, you have lights, HVAC, communication, doors, toilets, control, passenger information system, entertainment, condition monitoring systems that monitor the conditions of some components on the train. They are all can be described as a vehicle electrical system. They get various voltages up 1000 voltage DC or AC depending on the feed, how this train is being fed with energy. Is it through third rail? Is it uh, through overhead line? Because they have different, so an overhead line would have 25,000 kV AC. Uh, uh, for example, a third rail would have 750 volt DC. And for example, an induction motor, the AC motor will take a 450 volt three phase AC. Uh, and the power supply for an entertainment system would produce something like 240 volt AC. And sometimes you would you be using 110 volt DC. So there are there will be various voltages that is being transferred through power electronics and other uh, converter devices to make sure that the, all the electrical systems are working according to the right voltages and according to the voltages that, that they require. Rail vehicle power collection, how does the vehicle collect power? There are two, if it's electric, if, it's a, if it depends on electric and not, not diesel, then it will collect through either pantographs or shoe rail. And pantographs, it collects from the overhead line. It's like a, 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 an arc that uh, with, a contact, uh, with a contact force that is touching that line, or it can be through a shoe rail, which is touching a third rail and, that, uh, and collect the energy from that third rail. Uh, uh, some of the issues that while collecting power, the contact force between the pantograph and the overhead line can be different from one country to another. And high speed trains can have, uh, can have wings, some kind of support to control the pantograph and to control the contact force. Tilting trains need to keep the pantograph upright. When the train tilts, the pantograph should stay up, upright and carry on with its journey. So, I think we'll carry on talking about doors and the other system on the next section. So this was a section, uh, this was the, uh, some of the uh, subsystems that are part of the vehicle or, or of the railway vehicles. We carry on with more details in the next section. Have a great evening. See you in the next lecture.